uh, a very warm welcome to the latest of the, the Quarantimes series. Um, I'm uh, very, very happy to uh, be welcoming you back to uh, talk with Carolina Vigura. And I think what makes this particularly interesting is the work that she's been doing on emotions and their role uh, in politics, in contemporary politics. And she's written a lot about how strategies based on fear, nostalgia or hope have been used by political leaders all over Europe to mobilise populations. And I hope that she can tell us how COVID-19 is going to enter this complicated political environment and potentially change it. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Mark, for inviting me. And I'm really delighted to, to do this and to contribute to this wonderful series today. Um, so I basically like to make three remarks about uh, politics and emotions in the COVID era. So um, basically, there is a question uh, we are all uh, struggling with. And this is the question, why emotions matter? And when I think about why emotions matter, I basically... Um, think about uh, the, the 17th century uh, philosopher Baruch Spinoza, who had one of the most interesting approaches to emotions in politics. In, and he basically thought emotions precede politics. So it's not that we have politics and emotions are inside. It's rather that um, emotions precede politics. So we have to be aware of what emotions we are dealing with in order to um, to, to, to formulate uh, um, comprehensive and cohesive political responses. So um, if we ask what actually, what emotions we have at stake here um, during the, the, the pandemic, we can of course dig a little bit into the past testimonies of, uh, of, of uh, former epidemics. And there is a whole spectrum of such emotions, but I will only speak about three that are very often mentioned in the past testimonies, like for example, by Boccaccio or uh, Thucydides. So first there is of course fear. And fear is a lot uh, written about in the past testimonies, like in the history of Peloponnesian War. So, for example, it is the fear of sudden death, as Thucydides formulates it. So he basically says um, this is the, the, the biggest, the most domi dominant emotion of, of, of a plague that is in Athens. And he says it it changes everything. So it changes the at attitude to the rule of law. It changes the attitude to the political community. And I do believe that fear is also something that is chasing us today. Uh, there is a lot about, uh, there is a lot um, uh, of, of sanitary fear, uh, exactly like, like uh, in the times of Thucydides, but there is also a lot of fear of economic toll. So there is this fear of losing jobs. There is this fuel of economic crisis. Now, um, apart from fear, there is also, of course, uh, suspicion. Uh, and again, in the past testimonies, like in the history of Peloponnesian War, you have a lot about suspicion. Um, for example, Thucydides is asking whether the Peloponnesians did or did not poison the water reservoirs. And he says there is a discussion about it. Then you have uh, also based on suspicion in the 14th century, for example, pogroms uh, uh, on, uh, of, of Jews because they were accused of being the reason for, for the Black Death. And again, today we have very similar attitudes. Like, for example, we have a whole conspiratory theory about Jewish Chinese um, plot to, to the, 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 the fact that they sub allegedly uh, created uh, COVID-19 to change the world. So this is, this is the second uh, emotion. The third emotion that we find in the past testimonies of, of, of various plagues uh, is, is uncertainty. And this comes in many, many forms. So, for example, uh, you can find a form of uncertainty with this, which is connected with the fact that people are abandoning law. So the rule of law is basically ruined by, uh, by uh, 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 an epidemic. But today we have also a lot of uncertainty connected with moral choices. So, for example, there is a lot of, uh, of, of questions about um, prioritizing um, whom we should give medical help first. Yes, can we, for example, um, can we make such a moral uh, decision between the, the, the saved and the drowned, so to say? So these are the, the, the most important emotions I believe we find uh, in the past um, testimonies. But um, 
I have been also reflecting on what could um, contemporary uh, knowledge about human brain and human emotions bring us to this discussion. And this brings me to my second remark, namely, um, it, is, it has become quite popular in the past weeks to ask about the world after coronavirus. So we have all been asking about Europe world after coronavirus. But this question, I must say, makes me a little bit confused. It is as if we were trying to jump somewhere else. Because actually, it is now the time that we are living in. And if we are asking uh, all the time about the future, it is as if we were uh, neglecting the fact that, that the new normality is being built now. So, without treating this, this time of the COVID pandemic as an intermission between one normality and the other normality, we should rather ask, what is the normality of today? And this brings me to, to more contemporary reflection of, of, uh, on emotions. It is not a, a reflection of psychologists, but rather a reflection uh, of, of neuroscience. And here, uh, what is pointed at is how our brains react to sudden loss and how our brains react to sudden change. We know from our own experience that we undergo change all the time. Change is a process which is uh, inevitable in a, in, in a human life. Yes, so we, we all get mature and then we get older, we meet new people and then we we, we lose um, some connections and we, we um, find new jobs, we, 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 we lose jobs, etc., etc. But if the change is too rapid, if the change is too immense, then it results with a, a tremendous feeling of loss. And I believe this is also something that should be mentioned when we talk about emotions during the COVID pandemic. Namely, what we all experience today is not only fear, suspicion, and uncertainty, but also a certain kind of grief. And it is a collective grief, but this grief is rather not enough spoken about. It is a grief connected with loss of old habits, loss of old normality, loss of connection. But I would also like to mention that uh, it is also a grief connected with, uh, with the fact that lost that, that, that uh, social roles are lost. I believe, for example, that um, the time that we are going through, no matter how um, the, the parties in relationships are involved into caring for uh, important others, that this is actually a time of loss of uh, many achievements of the women movement. Because it's, it's simply impossible to, to go on like this, even if, uh, even if uh, both adults are trying to, to, to share their work, because it's impossible to, at, uh, for longer term, work and at the same time care for children or for elderly members of the of, of family. So I do believe that it's, it's extremely important to mention grief and um, and also to, 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 to mention all the different stages of grief that we can be in. When I was lo looking at, at five stages of grief, uh, uh, as, as they are described by psychologists, I thought this is all about coronavirus. So, so, so let's see, there is denial. So first we think, no, this will not affect us. It will not affect us, uh, neither me or my family. Then there comes anger. So we, we, we start to think, well, you make me stay, you the prime minister, you the president, you make me stay at home. And I'm extremely angry with it because I have to get rid of my old habits and my old normality. Then there is bargaining. So if I stay for two weeks at home, will it be enough? Can I go to work afterwards? Then there is sadness when we realize that we actually don't know when this is going to end. And then, and I must admit, I'm not at this stage, there is acceptance. Where, when we are, understand that this is really happening and we have to uh, figure out how to proceed. So um, I would just like to, to very um, briefly make uh, the third remark, the third and, uh, and last remark about uh, the emotions in politics in COVID era, because we have to ask what does it all have to do with politics? Um, what is politics actually during the quarantine? I would say, well, Politics in pandemics is 
simply politics, uh, to make a tra travestation of Clausewitz. I would say it's a continuation of politics, but with the means of expertise. And politics, well, politics in, 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 in pandemics is the same. And we have to be aware of that because um, when we come to speaking about liberal democracy and about uh, will it survive this time, we have to, uh, to understand that exactly like in the field of emotions where the COVID-19 has been a catalyst of emotions, like the emotion of fear, for example, or grief, in politics it is also a kind of catalyst. So in those countries where liberal democracy was respected before the pandemic, probably there is a chance that liberal democracy will not be uh, affected. But in countries uh, where liberal democracy was anyway in a very uncomfortable place, probably uh, the, 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 the consolidation of populism will take place. So when, when I'm speaking about this, I'm of course speaking about Hungary, where uh, Viktor Orban is already ruling by decree, but I'm also speaking about Poland, where the presidential election, as you probably know, has been shifted arbitrarily by Mr. Kaczynski without even looking for a larger consensus with the, with the opposition and with the, with the parliament. So um, if this is right, and if the COVID-19 will be a kind of catalyst will, which will consolidate, then it, is, uh, it, is, it, it means that, that COVID-19 will inevitably change the face of Europe. And just last but not least, I would like to make a remark about silence. Silence, I believe, was the most striking thing during uh, the beginning of the quarantine. Now, perhaps when the measures are not uh, anymore so rigid, we do not pay attention, at, uh, pay attention at silence so much. But I believe that silence matters. It matters in public sphere. When you look in, uh, in, into Montesquieu's writings, Montesquieu uh, wrote about deadly silence that is um, reigning in cities where the enemy is already uh, elevating the walls. Our enemy is invisible, but it's still there. But its silence in public sphere matters be because Montesquieu, and not only him, is associating silence with despotism. So whilst the citizens are busy at their homes, trying to survive, trying to care for their, uh, their important others, um, the politicians, can be very busy in making sure that the special measures will be longer term measures. And I do believe that this is a, the biggest challenge uh, connected with, uh, with the time of COVID-19. Because the silence in public sphere, the fear that makes us silent in the public sphere, it will not be um, um, supplemented. It will not, uh, it will not well, we, we won't find uh, a solution to this silence in the dim online. Uh, in the romantic era of internet, perhaps we could believe that, uh, that internet would give us tools to empower citizens. But I believe that we already uh, uh, are aware that internet brings us as much good as it brings also uh, dark sides. So if, if I would be to, to say what, what this... Uh, makes us really reflect on as, uh, as, as people who could uh, give advice to politicians in Europe. This means that, that uh, a fundamental thing would be to search for new tools that would be given to citizens in these very special uh, conditions that we live in. This is one thing. And another thing is, of course, um, the chase of, uh, of working with emotions. In the past few years, illiberal populists were much better in engaging people's emotions. They were simply quicker. They had the, the, the talent to, to embrace emotions and to translate those emotions into their political programs and pro political proposals. And I do believe that this is exactly the place where liberals could try to work harder this time and embrace fear, and the different uncertainties, but also uh, the, the feeling of loss and grief, and this time to translate those feelings into uh, those 
that can be um, working more positively for political uh, communities, like, for example, uh, translating fear into responsibility, uh, translating uncertainty into creativeness, etc., etc.